Hi, everybody. Um, welcome to the Essex Seminar Series. My name is Kazi. Um, I'm going to be the seminar moderator today. Um, today, we have Professor Eric Maloney from Colorado State University, um, and he is going to talk about the Madden-Julian Oscillation. Uh, also, as a note, the seminar is recorded. It will be posted on our YouTube channel in uh, just a couple of days, and we will have a Q&A session after the seminar. Um, so if you have any questions throughout, just type them in the chat and then we can address them afterwards. Um, so now I'm going to hand it off over to our associate director, Ralph Guerrero, and introduce the speaker. Yeah, thanks, Cassie. And yeah, welcome, Eric. We uh, look forward to your talk here in a second, so I won't take too much time. But uh, yeah, Eric's uh, uh, been a professor at Colorado State for about the last 15 years. He's uh, actually the uh, the chair of that department now, if I read his bio correctly, and uh, he's a uh, world um, expert in tropical meteorology. He's uh, done quite a bit of uh, field campaign work and uh, also served on several um, task force re regarding the modeling uh, that NOAA has. Uh, let's see, he also he's just recently became an AMS fellow and um, also has helped uh, organize and lead some field campaigns as well. Uh, and he's uh, he got his PhD um, atmospheric sciences at the University of Washington in 2000. So um, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Eric, uh, welcome. Thank you very much. So let me share my screen here. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah, that looks great. Okay, well, thank you, Ralph, for that great introduction and thank you um, for inviting me to give this talk today. So as Ralph mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about the Madden-Julian oscillation and looking at the consequences for subseasonal prediction in present and warmer climates. And the work I'm gonna show here is contributed by many uh, collaborators, and also I'll mention some of the collaborators as I go along here. So let's see. Um, so just as an introduction to what the Madden-Julian Oscillation is, for those who don't know, it's the leading mode of subseasonal variability in the tropics. And so this is a composite life cycle of the MJO that was created by Adrian Matthews at the University of East Anglia. And it shows precipitation anomalies cycling through the tropics. And so you can see MGO precipitation starts generally over the Indian Ocean and then propagates uh, slowly towards the east with time and eventually dies out in the Western Pacific. Um, if you look at the ticker on the upper right, people often separate the MJO into eight phases and it takes typically about 48 days for the MJO to go through its entire cycle. Whoops, let me go back here. So that's the precipitation anomaly, what it looks like. Um, I wanted to show briefly um, what the large scale uh, circulation structure of the MJO looks like because this will become relevant later. Um, this is, you know, for example, the MJO when it's in a state over the maritime continent. And you can see generally there's lower tropospheric wind anomalies converging towards the MJO center, upward motion, and then upper tropospheric winds diverging away. Um, the upper, troposphere, upper tropospheric divergent winds are actually very important for forcing teleconnections associated with the MJO. And so that's one reason why I wanted to show those here. Um, and of particular interest in how, is how those divergent wind um, anomalies change in a warmer climate. And so that might color how we think of um, MJO prediction in a future climate as the tropics warm. So I just wanted to point out that structure here before, before we move along. I'll talk about the thermodynamic energy balance on the right in future slides. So the MJO you know, doesn't stay in the tropics. Um, as it moves across the tropical band, it has impacts on circulations around the globe. And so this is a nice animation from Angel Adamas at the University of Wisconsin, and it shows a couple of things. One thing that it shows in colors is the barotropic, I'm not sorry, the baroclinic structure of the MJO. And you could think about this as being potentially surface um, pressure anomalies or upper tropospheric geopotential height anomalies associated with the MJO. 
And also shown here in contours is the barotropic uh, structure of MJO teleconnections as the MJO propagates through its cycle. Um, so you can see, for example, that in the tropics, there's a um, global reach of the MJO to parts of the Eastern Pacific and also the Atlantic. We'll talk about the modulation of tropical cyclones a little bit later. But you can also see, for example, in the North Pacific and over North America, geopotential height anomalies associated with the MJO that look like more of a wave train. And that's you know something that modulates severe weather in North America, it modulates atmospheric rivers, it modulates droughts, things like that. So we'll also talk about that feature as well. So as I alluded to, there are a myriad of weather impacts associated with the MJO, um, heat waves, blocking, North Atlantic Oscillation, extratropical cyclones. Um, here I'll concentrate on a couple of impacts. Tropical cyclones are things that are modulated by the MJO, which lend themselves to prediction at subseasonal timescales. And then, you know, West Coast precipitation associated with things like atmospheric rivers also show a very strong MJO modulation. But there's a lot of other um, impacts as well. So for example, the MJO interacts with El Nino Southern Oscillation, which is also something that um, might change in terms of its interaction in a warmer climate. Won't specifically talk about that, but that's something else that's, a, that's of interest. Okay, so first of all, you know, tr the tropics. And so if you look at places like the Eastern Pacific Warm Pool, if you look at places like the Atlantic, the MJO has a very strong modulation of tropical cyclone activity in those regions. So for example, if you look at the Gulf of Mexico and Caribbean Sea, there's a fourfold increase of tropical cyclone activity during certain phases of the MJO, here we call westerly phases versus easterly phases. Similarly in the main development region of the Atlantic. And so you could actually use this modulation to, um, you know, produce um, successful prediction models, you know, both dynamical and statistical models that allow you to predict, you know, tropical cyclone activity several weeks in advance. So one example of this is a, is some, is a work uh, that was just, um, you know, submitted by my uh, former student, um, Zybeth Carlo Frontera, along with Elizabeth Barnes here at CSU, where we used a neural network um, where we have a series of inputs here, including tropical cyclone counts um, from the climatology, El Nino Southern Oscillation, and Matt and Julian Oscillation information, as well as some other predictors, and use that to predict um, the likelihood of cyclogenesis out um, several weeks in advance. So you could actually show that um, Inclusion of the Matt and Julian oscillation into a you know very simple statistical model like that leads to um, you know useful uh, tropical cyclogenesis prediction skill out three to four weeks into the future. Um, this is for the Eastern Pacific. Um, we also developed a model for the Atlantic that shows very very similar things. So this is pretty exciting, and you're able to we're able to exploit um, MJO information at time zero for you know predictions almost a month in advance. We also looked at implications for prediction of precipitation along the U.S. West Coast. Though so, you know it probably doesn't need to be introduced too much to people here, but there's these phenomena called atmospheric rivers that, you know, hit the west coast of the United States and can contribute to flooding events um, in, you know, places like Northern California, Oregon coast, um, you know, other places up the coast into Canada. So we looked at, um, you know, prediction of atmospheric rivers as a function of MJO phase with one of my former students, Brian Munhank. And we showed that um, the state of the MJO has a pretty big influence on atmospheric river activity. Um, this is a plot for atmospheric river events in British Columbia on the top, California on the bottom, where the initial MJO phase is shown on the y-axis. And time into the future relative to MJO phase is shown on the x-axis. And so you could see this is a pretty substantial modulation of atmospheric river activity by the MJO 
that tends to be out of phase between places like California and places further north, like the western coast of British Columbia. So if your dynamical model or your statistical model doesn't get the MJO right in the tropics, it's very unlikely that you would be able to successfully predict West Coast precipitation several weeks in advance. And so that's actually something that we explicitly looked at with the NOAA UFS forecasting system. And next few slides I'm going to show you are the results of comparing free simulations of UFS to simulations of UFS in which the tropics are nudged to be realistic. Um, so we looked at hindcasts from 1999 to 2018 during boreal winter, and the nudged runs nudge UV temperature and humidity in the tropics. And this nudging allows the model to have a realistic uh, simulation of the MJO and other tropical disturbances um, within the tropics. And then we can look at their influence on higher latitude forecasts. Um, this plot on the upper right um, is something that was generated by my student Wei Ting Shou here at Colorado State University. And this is a bulk statistic. And so basically what we're looking at here is the three to four week Western US mean absolute error in a free run of GFS, which is shown in blue as compared to a nudged run of GFS, um, which, which is shown in red. And so you could see that um, the um, nudging in the tropics actually reduces the mean absolute error in um, you know, places along the United States West Coast indicated by this box here. So that's a bulk measure, but we also dug in to the model to see what states were associated with the biggest forecast improvements. And so we did a cluster analysis, um, you know, K-means cluster analysis to, you know, look at the states, you know, indicating the greatest forecast improvement in the model. And it turns out that the state in which um, the model shows the biggest West Coast forecast improvements is associated with Madden-Julian oscillation phases one through eight and warm El Nino events. The Z500 anomaly associated with these states and the precipitation anomaly associated with those states is shown in this panel. And what you could see is that the initial uh, precipitation anomaly field indicates enhanced uh, central to eastern uh, Pacific uh, precipitation, also enhanced Indian Ocean precipitation, and then a suppression of precipitation over the uh, maritime continent region. So again, this is MGO phases one through eight and warm ENSO events. So what happens in the freely running version of UFS is that you start the simulation with a, with a um, enhanced Aleutian low in the North Pacific. And this Aleutian low in the North Pacific basically uh, maintains its strength throughout you know, most, of the, uh, most of the forecast simulation. But with nudging, you actually see something very interesting happening. With nudging, the Aleutian low, nudging the tropics, the Aleutian low weakens in higher latitudes. And you also see less of an influence of the low on the West Coast of the United States. And this is exactly what it looks like an era I as well, which is, um, you know, which serves as the forecast truth um, for this particular set of simulations. So the West Coast simulates, it gets a very, very different evolution of forecast precipitation in the nudge field versus the free field. So what's going on here is, you know, actually kind of interesting. Um, this shows a plot of equatorial precipitation anomalies on the x-axis. Um, as a function of longitude and then forecast day in the model on the y-axis. And the left panel here shows what happens to these forecast anomalies in the tropics in the free run. And so you can see, as, you know, as I mentioned before, something that looks like ENSO and MJO phases one and eight, where you have enhanced central Pacific precipitation, suppressed maritime continent precipitation, and in the free run, this precipitation anomaly tends to persist throughout the entire forecast. And the forecast here goes to 21 days. With nudging, you actually see a difference in evolution. With nudging, you eventually see the maritime continent anomaly at least decaying after day 10. So it 
becomes uh, pretty small as far as anomalies after day 10. And this is indeed what happens in observations as well. So what's going on here is that um, in the nudged run, you have the presence of a Madden-Julian oscillation event, a positive phase of the Madden-Julian oscillation event propagating across the maritime continent at later times, which tends to suppress precipitation anomalies in this region. And so what happens in the free run as far as teleconnections is that you get this persistent um, negative and positive precipitation anomaly in the tropics, which is continually reinforcing the Aleutian low, whereas in the nudged run, that forcing by precipitation and divergent motions uh, gets suppressed. And so you get a weakening of the Aleutian low as a result. So basically, better simulating the MJO allows us to better simulate the tropical precipitation pattern that leads to better teleconnections. So pretty interesting study and finding from, from Wei Ting. Okay, um, so I, I showed that there are some important impacts of the MJO on both tropical and mid-latitude teleconnections that have implications for extreme events and getting the right MJO evolution in a forecasting model allows us to better predict these impacts. Now, one question that I've been thinking about a lot is how might this impact of the MJO on extreme events change in a future warmer climate? So we're gonna dig in to some of the potential effects here with um, not only the CMIP-5 archive, but also other models that that we've looked at to try to piece uh, you know, the possible effects together and what uncertainties there might be and how the MJO might change in a future warmer climate. Okay, so there are various basic state um, changes under climate change, which will affect this particular question. So one thing that um, you know, very basically will change MJO behavior in the tropics is, you know, simply the tropical wide mean humidity and um, dry static energy profiles and how those are gonna change in a future warmer climate. So this is a plot from a review paper I did on the MJO and climate change in 2019 in Nature. And what we show here are the tropical average changes in the moisture profile at the end of the 21st century um, in, the RCP 8.5 scenario, and this is a multi-model mean relative to the historical period. So one thing that happens is you could see that there's an increase in the vertical moisture profile in the tropics with climate warming at the end of the 21st century. And it's pretty well understood that this increase in the vertical moisture gradient and moistening in the lower troposphere will increase MJO precipitation anomalies. Um, you know, this acts on other time scales as well. Um, you know, other tropical disturbances, also, you know, time mean, things like that. But it's pretty well known and pretty well accepted that, you know, increasing the moisture profile of the tropics in this way will increase the amplitude of the MJO, particularly related to precipitation. And we'll show that in the next few slides. Um, but another th thing that happens um, that is very interesting is that you get preferential warming aloft in the tropics in a future warmer climate due to divergence of the war, uh, moist adiabats, you know, relative uh, to the surface warming aloft. And so you see a preferential dry static energy increase in the upper troposphere relative to the lower troposphere. And what this does is this increases the dry static stability of the tropics. And this has very important implications for MJO circulations um, that we see in a future warmer climate, especially relative, you know, especially per unit precipitation. So we'll look a little bit about you know, what, what this does. Okay, so another important thing that um, we are gonna look at is the impacts of the basic state jets and impacts that these have on MJO teleconnections. Um, this is a um, figure that was um, produced by Jing Xuan, um, who's one of my uh, postdocs in my group here. And it shows the change in upper tropospheric zonal winds in the CESM2 large ensemble at 2100 relative to today. 
And so you could see that in the North Pacific, the uh, North Pacific jet tends to extend further east in a future warmer climate. So this is going to be shown to have um, a relatively important um, you know, uh, part in you know, changing MJO teleconnections in a future warmer climate, especially as they extend over North America. So we'll look at this effect um, a little bit uh, as we go through the talk. And then one last thing that I wanted to talk about is the pattern of sea surface temperature change. Um, this is a figure that was just generated by Amanda Bowden, who's a master's student who just graduated from my group. It turns out that the degree of El Nino-like warming in the tropics um, can have a relatively significant impact on changes in MJO activity. So we'll look at this a little bit um, as well. This is actually the uh, CS on two large ensemble multi-model mean pattern, but there are some variations from one ensemble member to the next in exactly what the warming pattern looks like, which has um, potentially important consequences for the MJO. Okay, so so first of all, let's look at some you know bulk you know kind of statistics and how the MJO is projected to change in a future warmer climate. So this is a plot from Amanda's thesis, and the top here shows the multi-model mean CESM2 large ensemble historical MJO activity, um, and precipitation is on the left and zonal wind is on the right. And so basically how we constructed this is that we um, did a wave number frequency filter of both of these fields to 30 to 90 day periods and zonal wave numbers one through five. That's kind of where the MJO exists in wave number frequency space. And then we took the standard deviation of those fields um, and, and plotted them here. So consistent with the animation I showed you before, precipitation associated with the MJO generally um, maximizes during winter time, at least in the Indo-Pacific warm pool. Zonal wind anomalies um, also tend to maximize in this region, at least during boreal winter. So then what we did is we looked at changes in this variance distribution with climate warming. And first of all, I'll show what the multi-model mean looks like. And this is the percent change in the CESM large ensemble at 2081 to 2100 relative to the historical period. So precipitation uh, change is on the left. And so we, what you could see is that, you know, generally in most places of the tropics, most parts of the tropics, MJO precipitation amplitude, you know, goes up and it goes up particularly large uh, by particularly large percentages in the central and Eastern Pacific. And so there's in the central Pacific, like, you know, a 60% increase um, or greater in MJO precipitation amplitude in a future warmer climate. Um, and this shift towards the Eastern Pacific or, or you know, greatest increase in the Eastern Pacific, that's consistent with that El Nino-like warming state that we see in the tropical mean, in the ensemble mean. Um, the right-hand panel is maybe a little bit more interesting. Um, the right-hand panel shows the change in MJO zonal wind amplitude, and you could actually see that this is much more modest. And so, yeah, maybe if you averaged over the entire tropics, you could get a relatively um, you know small positive increase in MJO zonal wind amplitude, but it is much much smaller than what you see for the precipitation anomaly change. And in, in fact, some places like the Indian Ocean, the MGO, you know, wind anomaly amplitude, you know, goes down in a future warmer climate. So we'll dig into this a little bit. And this is, um, you know, very strongly related to changes in tropical static stability in the tropics with warming as, as I'll talk about later. The precipitation anomaly, the precipitation amplitude increase that is consistent with the warming pattern, but also, you know, generally with the increase in the vertical moisture gradient um, of, of, of the tropical atmosphere with, with warming. We'll talk about the wind changes a little bit more in a second. Um, let me talk a little bit more about the precipitation warming pattern in relation to SST change. So one thing you can do is you can take your ensemble, in this case, we have about 90 to 100 members, and divide the ensemble into 
the top 33% of members as far as MJO changes. And so you could take your top 33% um, you know, of your ensemble members, the ones that have the biggest MJO changes across the tropics and subtract off the ensemble members that have the least um, MJO amplitude changes in a future warmer climate. And you could look at the difference in sea surface temperature patterns associated with those two subset of members. And this is what it looks like. So it turns out that the models that have the greatest MJO amplitude increased, as long, at least in a tropical average sense, tend to have a more El Nino-like warming pattern with greater Eastern Pacific warming, maybe some hints of suppression or, or less SST warming in the Western tropical Pacific, and then more sea surface temperature warming in the maritime continent region. So basically models with more El Nino-like warming produce um, preferentially stronger MJOs in a future warmer climate. Um, the pattern in, from one decade to the next is, is actually regulated pretty strongly by decadal variability in the climate system and its realization in a given ensemble member. Um, so for example, um, the Pacific decadal oscillation is one thing that could, that could affect you know, within any 10 to 20 year period what the exact SST pattern looks like. And I think we're capturing um, some of that effect here. Um, this result that I show here, as far as you know, preferential Eastern Pacific warming, you know, creating stronger MJOs, was also noted by Takahashi et al. in 2011. Um, so why is this? I won't go into this in too much detail. There, I saw Min Shop An was on the call, and he um, has actually thought about things like this um, before. One thing that El Nino-like warming does create is um, a stronger vertical moisture gradient in the Eastern Pacific. And so the MJO can penetrate into that region more strongly. Another thing that this warming pattern creates is a, is a stronger meridional moisture gradient um, across the Western and Central Pacific. And that fosters eastward propagation of the MJO. Um, so, we, so we think we have some physical mechanisms to explain this. One thing that I should note, however, is that this is kind of a bulk um, analysis, you know, taking the average of the top 33 minus bottom 33%. 33%. If you look at individual ensemble members and relate the MJO change on the y-axis to the Nino 3.4 SST change, degree of SST change in the Nino 3.4 region, there's actually quite a bit of scatter. So it, not, you know, it doesn't fall along a one-to-one -one line. So there's other things going on other than the sea surface temperature pattern that determines whether you know, tropics-wide MJO amplitude increases in a given model. Likely a lot of internal variability in the MJO that actually um, contributes to this. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about the wind um, amplitude change and why that doesn't change quite as much. So let's go back to thinking about the vertical profile of the MJO. And now what I want to do is I want to invoke the dominant thermodynamic energy balance of the tropics um, you know, close to the equator in the region of very small, small Coriolis force. And this equation is, um, you know, basically what the thermodynamic energy equation boils down to in that region of weak tropical temperature gradients in the tropics. It results from, you know, essentially a balance between diabatic heating, uh, you know, apparent heating, Q1 here, and adiabatic cooling, um, which is, um, you know, generated by upward or downward motion in the tropical atmosphere. So under, you know, tropical conditions, this balance holds. And so essentially what it mandates is that um, upward motion is balanced by the product of apparent heating, which is proportional approximately to MJO precipitation times the inverse of static stability, which is defined here as the inverse of the dry static energy gradient. So a couple of schematic diagrams on here. I showed you the current climate on the left here. And then the right here is a nice figure generated by Angel Adamas for our paper, showing some of the changes that you might experience um, associated with the MJO in a warmer climate. 
Um, for the purposes of this um, discussion here and using this equation, I wanted to point out the um, you know, colors, you know, shading of the environment here. The shading in the environment here basically represents preferential warming aloft, like I showed you in that, you know, previous dry static energy plot. Um, so if you have preferential warming aloft, um, you know, relative to current climate, that increases the vertical dry static energy gradient. And, you know, the vertical dry static energy gradient is in this equation here. So what that implies is that you are going to get a weaker vertical velocity per unit diabatic heating if you preferentially warm the upper troposphere and increase the static stability, which you know comes through this DSDP term. So what this would predict is that MJO circulations, um, you know, per unit precipitation become more sluggish in a future warmer climate. And the next few slots slides I'm going to show here um, basically bear that out, at least in climate models. Okay, um, just wanted to make the point here, you could rearrange this equation to basically write the ratio of MJO wind anomalies to precipitation anomalies or Q1 anomalies as being proportional to the inverse of static stability. And we'll use this relationship in the next couple of slides. Okay, so... <clears throat> This is one place where we actually um, exploited that relationship. And so this is a study that was led by my former host postdoc, Heen Bui. And what we did is that we looked at MJO amplitude change in CMIP5 models under the RCP 8.5 scenario. And the left plot here shows changes in MJO precipitation amplitude averaged over the Indo-Pacific warm pool. And the brackets on here represent the standard deviation across the 11 um, ensemble members from the CMIP ar archive that we looked at that produced good MJOs in historical climate. And the color bars on here represent um, the percentage change in MJO precipitation. So in the CMIP 5 archive generally, what you could see is that by 2081 to 2100, there is an increase in MJO Precipitation, precipitation amplitude um, would average it across the warm pool by about you know 10% relative to um, you know historical conditions in the multi-model mean. There's still quite a bit of scatter, but the you know signal does tend to emerge from the noise when you get towards the end of the 21st century. So that's consistent with those previous plots that I showed. Changes in MJO wind amplitude um, in the warm pool is more interesting. It actually goes, um, tends to go in the opposite direction. Um, you know, a lot of scatter in the initial decades, but by the time you get to 2081 to 2100, at least in this limited set of 11 ensemble members, there's a modest decrease in MJO wind amplitude um, by about, you know, 10%. Um, that's barely detectable above the standard deviation um, across models. So, so again, you know, this hints that, you know, maybe tropical static stability, as I showed you before, um, might be having an influence on this. But what's even more compelling that it is, is this particular plot here. Um, this particular plot shows, let me go back here, shows the um, change in the ratio of MJO omega to precipitation amplitude. Um, you could also use a U850 amplitude if you wanted, but this is the percentage change of omega um, to precipitation. And you could see that, you know, even by early parts of the record, 2021 to 2040, the um, change relative to the historical period in this ratio can actually, you know, actually emerges from the historical period. And this ratio decreases by about 20% um, by the time you get to you know, 2081 to 2100. So what this is saying is that, um, you know, while changes in MGO precipitation and wind amplitude might not be detectable until later in the 21st century under this scenario, um, changes in the, you know, relative amplitude of those two things can be detected even earlier in the record um, that, you know, is shown on this plot. So is this consistent with changes in tropical static stability in models? Um, we show that here. So 
the x-axis here, I'm sorry, the y-axis shows the percentage change in MJO wind precipitation, um, you know, towards the end of the 21st century in the darkest colors, 2081 to 2100. So that's the y-axis and what we'd be predicted by changes in tropical static stability in the models is shown on the x-axis. So this is the change in the inverse of dry static energy gradient. And they pretty much uh, fall along a one-to-one -one line. And so you get a pretty good prediction of how much the ratio of MGO wind and precipitation amplitude is gonna change um, if you know what the static stability change of, uh, the, of the tropical atmosphere is in these models. So, um, you know, rarely do you, you know, get something that agrees, you know, th this well. Um, again, the standard deviation is shown by the, um, you know, lines here um, across the 11 ensemble members that we looked at. So, so this is, you know, pr pretty interesting evidence. So I guess you could ask the question, you know, have we actually seen changes to the relative amplitude of MJO wind and precipitation in the historical record? Um, it's hard to go back too far, um, you know, before you start relying very strongly on models. But, you know, we did that. And so this is era five on the left. This is era 20th century on the right. And on both of these plots on the y-axis, we have the percentage change in the ratio of MJO wind amplitude to precipitation amplitude. Um, and on the x-axis, we have the change in static stability um, you know, over you know, different time periods in these two different reanalysis products. Obviously, there's lots of caveats here. Um, we are using reanalysis precipitation in this analysis, which um, I typically don't do, but it's the only thing that we could use to, you know, extend back at least into the earlier parts of the 21st century. Um, <clears throat> each of these dots on here is a different 18 year period. So for example, on the left here, we start in the period 1981 to 1999. And then by the end here, we go into the 19 year period, 2000 to 2018. So in era five, you could see about a, you know, seven, you know, four, you know, sorry, 4% or so decrease in the ratio of MJO wind to precipitation amplitude. And this broadly follows the static stability change that we see in era five. So, Again, you know, evidence seems consistent and maybe we're starting to see evidence of, you know, changes in the relative amplitudes of wind and precipitation in the observed record. It becomes even more apparent um, when you look back into the early 1900s. Here, you probably get on the order of like, uh, you know, 8% or so, 7-8% um, or so decrease in both static stability, um, inverse of static stability, and also MGO wind to precipitation ratios. So maybe we could see something here that's um, you know detectable already in the observational record. Again, lots of caveats um, to this. Um, we're using reanalysis precipitation, which you know I'd like to avoid. Possibly there's some way of getting at these relationships with uh, you know sounding data and other stuff like that that you know if you have any ideas I'd be I'd be happy to hear them. All right, maybe I won't show this. Um, you know I, I just wanted to point out here that we have a more recent paper with the CMIP, I'm sorry with the CES on two large ensemble where we look at time of emergence, very consistent with what, what I showed before emergence of wind and precipitation um, amplitude changes with the MJO. You could see those at the end of the 21st century, but um, changes in the emergence of the ratio of precipitation to wind, you could you could get them much earlier. So won't go into, into this in too much detail, but basically consistent um, with what I just showed. And this is a paper in, in Nature Geosciences. Okay, so in the last part of this talk, I want to discuss what possible implications might this weakening of MJO wind to precipitation amplitude have for MJO teleconnections and their effects on extremes in a future warmer climate. 
You could imagine other impacts as well, such as the ability of the MJO to force ENSO and stuff like that. I won't get into those, but let's just think about teleconnections a little bit. So some equations on this plot, um, I'm not gonna go through it, but I wanted to point out that um, there's an analysis done by, you know, Sarge Schmuck and Hoskins, you know, Sumant has, has looked at things like this, you know, extensively in the past as well that have looked at um, forcing of stationary Rossby waves in the extra tropics. And one of the ways that this has been formulated is to look at something called the Rossby wave source by Sharj Mug Hoskins in 1988. And the Rossby wave source is shown by this S term here. And one of the terms that goes into the Rossby wave source is um, advection across an absolute vorticity gradient by the divergent wind. And so if we're thinking about stationary Rossby waves being forced by the MJO and the divergent wind field associated with the MJO decreases in amplitude, we may see a decrease in MJO teleconnections in a future warmer climate. So we wanted to look at that a little bit. And it turns out it's a complicated question, more complicated um, than we might have expected. So there's a lot of work that still needs to be done there. Um, we looked at this in one model. So this is a model called the superparameterized community earth system model. It basically is like taking the NCAR climate model, stripping out the cloud parameterizations and putting in um, a concept called superparameterization, which is a two-dimensional you know, curtain that represents a cloud resolving model within each model grid cell. And we use this model to look at MGO teleconnections um, in current climate, and four times CO2 climate, which is shown by these two panels here. And this is an analysis that was done by Brandon Wolding and Stephanie Henderson, former students of mine. In the current climate, um, during one phase of the MJO phase four here, you can see a very strong teleconnection extending from the North Pacific, where you have positive geopotential height anomalies over Western North America, and then down into the Southeastern United States. This is a pattern that looks like the Pacific North America pattern. And then what we looked at was how does this teleconnection change for MJO events in a future warmer climate? And you see a weakening of this MJO teleconnection in a future warmer climate, which is consistent with what would be predicted by weakening of MJO circulations and divergent wind forcing due to increases in static stability of the tropics. And so we looked at the amount by which this teleconnection weakened. And it was indeed um, consistent with the increases in tropical static stability in this model. So we thought that's pretty cool. But the other thing that you note here in this paper is that not only does this teleconnection weaken, but it changes its spatial location. So it actually shifts eastward in a future warmer climate. And in fact, it shifts eastward to have a bigger impact on the west coast of the United States. So even though the teleconnection might weaken, you know, it might actually have a bigger impact on extreme weather like atmospheric rivers along the US west coast that has implications for prediction. So there was a study that specifically looked at this. Um, this is a study by Joe et al. 2020 that looked at, I think this is the CMIP-6 archive, the nature of the teleconnection uh, from the MJO change to extra tropics. And, you know, consistent with that, you know, paper from Brandon Wolding that I showed, it seems like the teleconnection in this model, you know, maybe strengthens a little bit. It's kind of hard to say, it basically says the same strength, but there's a well-defined shift eastward of this teleconnection such that it has um, a bigger influence on the United States West Coast. And then there's been other people ha that have looked at this problem as well. This is a very um, neat paper um, done by Wong et al. in 2022, where they looked at the nature of the MJO teleconnection and CMIP-6 models and reasons for changes of the MJO teleconnection. So this particular paper <clears throat> came to the conclusion that's shown on the right hand side here. Basically, um, they said that the ro most robust and significant change in MJO teleconnections in the future 
is an eastward extension of the MJ Hotel connection in the North Pacific towards the North American coast. So they cited that as being the most robust and significant change. And then other changes like amplitude, um, you know, persistence, things like that, those are a lot more uncertain. So that was the conclusion that this paper came up with. And the reason that they gave for the eastward extension is what I cited before. Um, each of these is a model showing the historical U200 behavior and the colors here represent the change in over the 21st century. And basically the North Pacific jet extends towards the coast in um, most of these ensemble members, most of these models. And so that tends to shift the MJO eastward and have a bigger impact on North America. So that's the conclusion of this paper. Um, I still think it's a little bit unsettled though. This is another paper that was published, you know, maybe just a little bit before by Andrea Jenny and Dave Randall and Elizabeth Barnes here in our department. And they come up with um, a somewhat different conclusion. So, you know, they cite the MGO teleconnection being sensitive to a number of factors, including dry static stability, which I talked about changes in the mean flow like jet extensions, you know, changes in the characteristics of the MGO itself. Um, but their major conclusion is they found that decreases in the MGO teleconnection amplitude due to dry static stability changes alone are robust. And then uncertainty in the mean winds um, is, um, you know, creates uncertainty, um, you know, between models and in, in how that actually has an impact. So different conclusion than the Wang et al. paper. And so I think that there's actually, you know, quite a few, quite a bit of work that still needs to be done on, um, you know, uh, understanding how the MJO, um, you know, teleconnection might change in a future warmer climate and why. Okay, one last thing here, and I want to talk a little bit about top tropical teleconnections, maybe in the next, uh, you know, three minutes. So if you decrease MJO wind amplitude, you could imagine that that could also have an impact on the ability of the MJO to foster cyclogenesis and things like that. So we looked at that um, in a paper by, you know, the paper by Heen in uh, 2022. Um, looking at the left here, this is basically the observed way that the MJO impacts the Eastern tropical Pacific during summertime. You see that there's MJO wind anomalies, you know, from the West that, radiate into the Eastern Tropical Pacific, associated with precipitation anomalies over the Eastern Pacific warm pool. And these periods tend to be associated with an enhancement of cyclogenesis events over this region. We looked at this in the CMIP-6 archive, um, GPM precipitation anomalies during these enhancement periods looks like the left. So you can see westerly winds and enhanced precipitation. Historical simulations with the CMIP-6 archive look pretty realistic, um, westerlies and enhanced precipitation. But one interesting thing that you see is that largely because of weakening in MJO circulations per unit precipitation, you get a weakening of MJO wind anomalies um, during these um, you know, enhanced MJO periods in this region. So this might have some important implications for the ability of the MJO to foster tropical cyclogenesis. Um, this is a genesis potential index that was derived by Nolan and Emanuel. And our understanding of the large scale variables that foster cyclogenesis um, include uh, many things in this particular equation here. We have the background um, you know, vorticity gradient you know, shown by Ada relative humidity, potential intensity, which relates to SST relative to the tropical mean, vertical shear. If you weaken MJO wind anomalies, then you would expect to affect at least a couple of things in this genesis potential index. You would expect to weaken variations in absolute vorticity that foster cyclogenesis, and you would also affect vertical wind shear. And when we applied this equation to you know, future climate in the Eastern tropical Pacific, um, especially looking at genesis potential during MJO events, we actually see a weakening of potential for tropical cyclogenesis near the coast of Central America in this region that suggests 
that at least close to the coast, the MGO may have less of an impact on modulating tropical cyclones than we see in historical, um, you know, the historical simulations of this archive. And so that's, uh, you know, something that, you know, will affect, you know, our prediction model, you know, ML based prediction model that I showed you before. The pattern of sea surface temperature change being El Nino-like also affects this distribution and tends to shift it towards the Southwest, but weakening of MGO winds is certainly a big part of it. Okay, so let me conclude here. So the implications of the MJO for precipitation and precipitation in extremes in current climate was examined. So I showed you, um, you know, some implications for dynamical model simulations, but I also showed you some results from a statistical model. Um, climate warming produces various basic state changes that produce complex effects on MJO amplitude, um, the spatial distribution of the MJO, and also teleconnections. So while MGO precipitation variability goes up in a warmer climate, you know, because of the moisture lower troposphere, the increases in tropical static stability reduce the strength of MGO circulations per unit precipitation. And so this latter effect, weakening of MGO flows, um, may have uh, some profound impacts on tropical teleconnections. Um, you know, to the extra tropics and also within the tropics. And this has important implications for predictions of extremes. And I've come to realize that this is a very complicated problem that has a lot of moving parts. And so I think there's still a lot of work that needs to be done to actually understand, you know, not only the nature of the MJO uh, teleconnection changes, but also um, how and why. Um, and certainly, um, you know, improved models and improved uh, you know, representations of the MJOs and models will aid this endeavor to understand this problem. So with that, I will say thank you and take any questions. I was muted. Thanks, Professor Maloney. If uh, you have any questions, now is the time. Uh, you can type them in the chat if you want me to read them out loud, or you can raise your hand to ask it verbally. Go ahead, Suma. Hi, Eric, that was a lovely talk. Uh, uh, you clarified a lot of things. Uh, I especially like the interpretation of uh, vertical velocity per unit precipitation and its relationship with static stability. But I'm not surprised to see that relationship because it is the elemental thermodynamic balance in the tropics, and the models are just being mindful of that uh, in the scenarios or in the composites uh, that you analyzed. Uh, so... so uh, mm -hmm. But the fact that uh, MJO circulations are weakening, I think uh, you made a very nice uh, sort of argument and uh, case for that. Uh, one small thing at the beginning of the talk, when you were looking at machine learning, and I think this was the work with uh, Elizabeth Barnes and someone else, and you were showing improvement in skills. Mm -hmm. If you included uh, RMM1 and RMM2, and I found that when you included both RMM1 and RMM2, the improvement was less than just including RMM1. Yes. This, this uh, one here. <laughs> yes. So if I look at RMM, you know, the purple one, which is mm -hmm. RMM1 plus 2, that is a little lower than... Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. yeah. I see what... Yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, I honestly do not have an explanation for that. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, and what, one thing that we could say from this plot is that, in, you know, we, we also, one thing I didn't mention is include RMM1 and 2 at a time lag where we import it from the previous seven days. And so that seems to better capture the evolution of the MJO in the tropics and improves the model. So you can see a jump up in both of those things. But yeah, you're absolutely right. I do not know why 
That's you know, okay. especially at time zero. And, and yeah, I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's a good okay. question. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Yeah. Um, re regarding your other comment, though, I mean, I guess one thing that I did sweep under the rug is that, um, you know, my net analysis of tropical static stability does assume that changes to the vertical structure of Q1 associated with the MJO are relatively small. But that may not necessarily be the case. There, um, in some of the models that we looked at, are changes in the vertical structure of MJO heating that can um, have an impact on the nature of divergent flow in the upper troposphere and teleconnections. It's a second order effect, but that is something that I, you know, I guess. I'm gonna criticize my own work that <laughs> my own talk that that we didn't uh, um, you know haven't looked at to its uh, you know full extent in in, in the models we, we looked at. So that's another thing that can affect things. Thank you. Yeah. Go ahead, Dwight. You can ask your question next. Okay. Yes. Uh, this is Dwi Susanto. Thank you very much, Eric. Uh, it's very nice talk. I have a few questions. First of all, it's about the MGOSF. Mm -hmm. Whether my understanding is that MGO is uh, not always occur every year, so that there is a uh, active year and non-active year. So I wonder whether your model can pick up like that uh, those uh, kind mm -hmm. of uh, intermittent. And the second one is is that sometimes this is also it's just my understanding is because I'm not expert in the. MGO. Sometimes when MGO uh, generated in the Indian Ocean, pass to the Indonesian maritime continent, it's kind of like a uh, blur and then pick up again or sometimes stop uh, within the Indonesian seas. So would you mind to explain uh, why this happened? Yeah, so um, as far as the first one, that is a very good question. That That's actually a question that Amanda Bowden was asked during her master's presentation, you know, the results of it here. I, I made the point here that there's a, a lot of scatter in the relationship between MJO precipitation change and um, Nino uh, 3.4, um, you know, SST change. And so Nino 3.4 only explains, you know, I don't know, like 20% uh, of the variance of MJO amplitude change. And the question Amanda got was, you know, um, is internal MJO variability, um, th does that explain why there's so much scatter there? And, you know, secondly, um, does the model in the historical period, you know, simulate um, MJO internal variability right? And so, that's a question that we haven't answered yet, but one thing that we want to do is to take a really long historical simulation, maybe, you know, even an atmosphere only version of this model over, you know, um, the climatological sea surface temperatures and see what the year to year variability of MJO um, amplitude actually is. And so that's something that I think would be really useful to look at. And I don't know how realistic it is yet. Um, so we're going to look at that. The other, the, the second question um, about the ability of the MJO to you know, propagate through the maritime continent and appear on the other side. Um, I think um, several people have have looked at this issue recently. Like Minshop, who's online, has, has looked at this issue, and you know, with Day on Kim and others. And one of the factors for regulating whether the MJO could propagate across is the strength of the meridional moisture gradient um, across the maritime continent and into the Western Pacific. Um, there's a theory called moisture mode theory, which you know um, says that you know the processes regulating the moisture field and its propagation you know help to explain MJO uh, maintenance in, in in propagation uh, across the tropics. And one of the major ways that the MJO propagates eastward under this theory is through meridional advection by the anomalous MJO flow across the mean moisture gradient. And so time periods where you have a stronger mean meridional moisture gradient across the maritime continent in Western Pacific would tend to support MJO propagation across that region. So that's one of the leading hypotheses for 
how this might happen. There's others, um, you know, others have looked at the spatial scale of DMJO, whether it's, you know, zonally confined heating or zonally broad heating, any ability of that to force interseasonal Kelvin waves over the Western Pacific that then cause the MJO to move across. So there's other thoughts, but I like the work on, you know, the, the stronger meridional moisture gradient tending to support eastward propagation across that region. Thank you. There's also a chat question. I'll go ahead and read that one out loud. Uh, or you can open the chat and read it with me. Yeah. But uh, Min Sapan says, thank you for the great talk. Regarding the dry static energy change in the future, you describe the impact of increased static stability on MJO, but it seems like the static stability decreases above 200 HPA. Is there any impact of the decreased static stability above 200 HPA on MJO? Yeah, I think the answer to that is most likely there is. Um, you know, kind of consistent with my um, you know answer I gave to to Sumont as as far as you know changing the vertical structure of heating affecting MGO te teleconnections. Um, you could also imagine that um, decreased static stability uh, above 200 hectopascals can help to change the vertical structure and, and, and possibly deepen um, you know, convective anomalies associated with the MJO that would change the height of convective outflow and things like that. So I suspect the answer to that is yes, but um, we haven't we haven't really looked at that yet to you know, for me to say specifically how how that would work. Thank you. Do we have any other questions before we wrap up? Okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for coming and uh, to our seminar today. And thank you so much, Professor Maloney, for giving us this great talk. Um, as a reminder, it will be on our YouTube channel in just a couple of days. So if you want to review anything, um, it will be there. And then uh, thanks everybody, please join us next week. It's We're gonna have an in-person seminar um, and our speaker is Brian Gross. Um, so it'll be pretty exciting. Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. Thank you, everybody. Have a great uh, day, everybody.